Unlimited Podcast. Welcome to Automated. I'm your host, Mark Verbenkov, and in this weekly podcast, we will be exploring the impact of emerging technology on jobs, society, as well as us, with business and technology leaders, researchers, and independent professionals across the world. Okay, so as we get closer and closer to the 100th episode, I think it's becoming more and more clear that one of the main themes of this podcast is the exploration of the new industries where many future jobs might develop, not just the automation of jobs and work as a whole. So much like the automobile industry rose up and disrupted the horse and buggy industry, leading to, I guess you could say, one of the largest job markets today, the metaverse, AI development, and the new space industry are all likely candidates for new job growth. So uh, over the last uh, several episodes, I've brought on multiple guests to talk about the current challenges to the space industry in particular. But I think it's important to look at some of the more exciting space-based projects that are either envisioned or even carried out today to give a much better perspective of why new jobs will be developed here for years to come. And I think to kind of start off, let's look at some of the more known projects, which I'm sure many of you guys have heard of before. So to kick things off, let's look at Starlink. So uh, I think that many of the guests that have actually come onto the podcast to talk about this new space industry have talked about the specific growing number of both live and dead satellites in orbit, the challenges this poses to launches and space exploration in general. So the more popular project that adds to this issue is, of course, Starlink. So the goal of Starlink is to have about 12,000 satellites in orbit that provide affordable and reliable broadband connectivity across the world, with a focus on remote areas that tend to have limited or no real access currently. So the network that is provided is not meant to connect directly to your mobile when you're using it, but it's rather through an installed home antenna kit that Starlink actually provides. And this uh, enables download speeds at around 100 megabytes per second, so it's actually quite uh, useful for today's uh, modern internet uses. Currently, there are already some 2,000 satellites in operation that are serving about 10,000 customers in over 14 countries. There have been some mild connectivity issues, though, but the main concerns uh, surround the disruption to telescopes and observatories across the world with so many satellites in the sky, as well as the potential domino effect, which has been talked about in previous episodes. This is where orbital collisions uh, can lead to catastrophic problems for future launches and space exploration in general. Luckily, there have already been efforts to reduce the brightness, uh, reflectivity, and overall visibility of the satellites, and a de-orbit propulsion system has been integrated in each satellite, enabling them to kind of burn up in the Earth's atmosphere once their uh, work has been completed. We're moving away from Starlink. Uh, One of the more uh, popular new space industries programs is space tourism. So previously, only highly trained astronauts, of course, could experience zero-g and low orbit through the large financial backing of governments. But today, this is possible through private companies and, of course, an expensive ticket. There is considerable growth opportunity here, as the space tourism industry is estimated to be only about $2 billion U.S. dollars uh, by 2030, and the global tourism industry was worth $1 trillion in 2020 even admits the global pandemic. So there's a massive amount of room for the uh, space tourism industry to grow. Uh, Virgin Galactic successfully reached the edge of space with a full crew in cabin for the very first time in July 2021. And tickets go anywhere up to about 450,000 US dollars. And passengers only experience three to four minutes of weightlessness before coming back uh, down to Earth. Over 600 people have already uh, booked a ride, and due to this initial successful flight, it is expected that many more will actually be pre-booking their tickets. So though this is just the beginning of space tourism, I think this is actually quite an important subject uh, in actually supporting or funding the new space industry as a whole, especially as we look to the uh, next future space projects, which are incredibly expensive. 
so thirdly, and I think perhaps the most talked about when it comes to uh, new space industry projects is, of course, the Mars colony. And this is, of course, pushed by uh, Elon Musk and is also the largest in scope. So with the ultimate goal of having 1 million colonists enabling a fully self-sufficient base, this project has gathered attention for already several years now. And uh, actually in a recent interview, I think it was just one or two weeks ago, uh, Elon Musk explained that for this to start, um, t- for this to start to happen in the 2030s, nearly 1,000 ships taking about 100 people each would need to make the journey about every two years to establish and continuously supply this base. So this is a monumental fleet when you really think about it, not to mention all the support in creating about the one rocket per month that is actually going to be needed to have this entire project succeed. So ignoring all the controversies surrounding whether this is actually feasible or even desirable compared to, say, dealing with the problems here on Earth, this project in and of itself will generate an enormous need for labor and, of course, the supporting industries. Slightly connected to the Mars colony and most probably uh, something to be set up before that goes through is, of course, the moon base. So it's, of course, a little bit closer to Mars, and there are already plans to establish a moon base from a number of um, competing programs. So there's two dominant programs for this. One is the Artemis program led by NASA, and the other is the International Lunar Research Station, the ILRS, led by China and supported by Russia. So the NASA Artemis project will actually commence in 2024 with a crewed mission to the moon and hopefully a sustained presence will start to happen in 2028. The purported goal here is to host four astronauts and use lunar materials and turn them into usable resources while having vehicles to explore the moon further. And perhaps more importantly, the lunar base will be used as a testing ground for Mars missions, training astronauts in long-duration missions to prepare for the long space flights to Mars. The China and Russian program, though, has a very different goal. So the ILRS will host five groups of people to establish a sustainable colony and ultimately have between 20 and 40 full-time people mainly involved in material extraction, such as zinc and titanium, and uh, even possible fuel sources such as helium-3, which of course still needs to be further researched. The hope is that by 2050, the base will have a fully sustained presence, and there are current missions that are actually mapping ideal locations to set up the base right now. But moving on and kind of a as a continuation of the space tourism idea, uh, one notable project is actually the first orbiting hotel uh, that should be ready this decade. So the Voyager station is expected to begin construction in 2026, could use the SpaceX Starship as transportation and accommodate about 280 guests and 112 crew members. Though the trip would only be three and a half days, the ticket price would range around 5 million US dollars. Due to its design being similar to a rotating wheel, some artificial gravity would be produced, and in typical tourism fashion, some recreational activities have already been planned for guests to enjoy the gravity, which is uh, equivalent to that of the moon. So according to the official website, automation and telerobotics will play a predominant role in the construction of this space hotel. Uh, which will be important as this will be the largest man-made structure in orbit if it ever gets the investment and backing needed to start. We'll just have to wait and see. Similarly, there are plans for the ISS, or the International Space Station, which will have the official end of the International Partnership in 2024, uh, to have a section detach and continue as an autonomous commercial station. Now, this will allow it to act as both a research station, but also, more relevantly here, as a space hotel. So there is a clear trend towards more and more commercialization of these projects and assets compared to the past. Now, one of, if not the most hyped space ventures, is asteroid mining. So though reduced in scope and interest due to the technological and economic hurdles from the kind of early fervor of the 2010s, there have been some successful missions already. 
so most notably the Hayabusa missions, were able to return material from asteroids, providing the viability of this venture, at least technologically. However, the amounts returned, which were 1 milligram and 100 milligrams, with the 300 and 800 million dollar price tags of both missions, challenged the kind of economic viability of the industry as a whole. And most ambitions have shifted to more long-term goals or towards other opportunities for now. That being said, there was a reason for the significant appeal of making this viable, especially given our current technological age, which consumes rare materials at an alarmingly faster rate every year. So for instance, in 1997, it was speculated that a relatively small uh, metallic asteroid with a diameter of 1.6 kilometers contains more than, uh, and this is in US dollars, $20 trillion worth of industrial and precious metals. A comparatively small asteroid with a diameter of about one kilometer could contain more than 2 billion metric tons of iron nickel ore, or two to three times the world production of 2004. And as a specific example, there's an asteroid called 16 Psyche, and it is believed to contain enough nickel iron to supply the world's production requirements for several million years. So a small portion of the extracted material. So this was one of the main reasons why asteroid mining was such a uh, hyped up idea or hyped up industry several years ago. And it was even said that, you know, uh, the company or the individual that would be able to successfully develop a asteroid mining venture would most probably be the world's first trillionaire due to the amount of uh, profits that could be generated from uh, such, a, such a venture. But as it stands now, due to the already uh, mentioned technological hurdles, this is something that is pushed off a little bit more into the future. Uh, but speaking of the future, right, so these are some of the kind of near-term projects that, uh, that have been discussed. But when looking at the future of space exploration in a much more long-term phase, um, and the space industry as a whole, there are a few interesting ideas um, without getting too far into the realm of sci-fi. So though a growing industry does further support the idea of increased labor requirements, uh, new jobs being born, and in general more human activity, there's also some viability to the removal of human interaction or need, specifically when considering more long-term futures. But before diving into that, let's look at a something called amateur rocketry, which supports this idea of more jobs and increased human interaction in this exciting industry. So just as advancements in technology, deregulation, and investment interest have made it possible for private companies to play a major role in the space industry, there is currently a growing amount of rocket and space work done by amateurs. So for example, uh, in 2004, the Civilian Space Exploration Team successfully launched a rocket into space. Now, why is this important? Apart from it just not being a uh, government-owned organization or private-owned uh, organization that actually has enabled a rocket to escape Earth's gravity. Um, it's important for CubeSats. Now, CubeSats are small cube-shaped satellites that are low in cost and can actually be developed quite quickly. Um, and have already been built by a number of universities and launched on the back of other rockets, um, giving academic groups the opportunity to collect research data directly. Now, those rockets that they were kind of piggybacking on were these uh, private rockets and the government-owned rockets. But what is really interesting here is if other civilian or amateur groups are able to launch um, their own rockets into space, uh, these CubeSats could be piggybacked onto uh, these amateur rockets, enabling an entire, you know, definitely smaller uh, industry size, but nevertheless uh, uh, an amateur or civilian industry that would enable uh, individuals to, to do space exploration and different types of research activities without relying on public or private enterprises and, of course, the rockets that they employ. 
So this, of course, is very interesting as it kind of falls into this uh, theme of democratizing technology and access to different things that uh, were typically only uh, available to large entities. Um, but we're still at the start of this, and it'll be quite interesting to kind of track this as time goes forward. Uh, but that's more or less in the near to kind of midterm future. If we're looking more at the far future, uh, there's actually a podcast that I can recommend that that focused on this a little bit more specifically. This is the Lex Friedman podcast, and he uh, recently had a guest that actually discussed self-assembling space megastructures as part of the colonialization of space that humans will eventually do. I'll have the link in the show notes. Uh, and the interview itself is quite interesting overall, uh, especially as we are currently building out Uh, these self-sensing structures that can communicate basic functions like air quality or any damage that's done to its structure. And this idea is kind of extrapolated and um, grown out to these space structures that will um, have the different kind of sensors and movement capabilities to come together and join as a fully unified structure that can be used for the future space colonists. But finally, there is the concept of self-assembling space exploration probes, which is a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it's a really interesting idea. So I first heard this uh, from Michio Kaku, uh, who discussed this years ago as actually the most efficient way for us to explore the galaxy. And this is where essentially an autonomous probe could land on a moon or asteroid, uh, mine necessary materials, and set up a small factory to build more probes that could then be shot out and expand further out and kind of copy the process continually expanding in kind of a, an exponential wave. Um, it was estimated that these probes could actually occupy all four corners of the Milky Way in half a million years. And this is uh, when compared to the short life of an astronaut and the vast stretches of space, it actually makes more sense to automate uh, space exploration Uh, than it does to use humans, especially in this kind of far future or late space exploration phase. Um, But as I mentioned earlier, this is still years and years off. And for the time being, it appears that the space industry will grow significantly, generate work and jobs as time goes on. Now, as kind of a final thought here, there are several space exploration projects that I didn't include here. Uh, I think that they are all, of course, amazing in their own way but overall felt like they were more incremental changes rather than significantly different leaps. Um, Such uh, examples like uh, exploring the icy moons of Jupiter, uh, Mars exploration missions with uh, probes and rovers, improving telescopes and new satellites, sampling asteroid materials, and uh, probes that can test and measure the sun, although this last one I think is quite interesting, still kind of just develops upon the um, idea of using probes to... Uh, explore parts of our of our solar system. Um, so these are some of the more uh, interesting, but as I mentioned, not uh, too grandiose in uh, in change compared to the other things that we've been doing. Um, but if there are other uh, projects or missions that you think should be added to the list, let me know. Um, but that's it for uh, for today's episode, looking at the uh, new space industry and kind of the new projects that will influence the amount of jobs and the type of jobs that could come out in the next uh, couple of years. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast and the conversations here, the best way to do this is to go onto Apple Podcasts and leave a review as it helps the algorithm to reach out to new listeners and brings the show to them. Also, feel free to check out the website, automatedpodcast.org, where you can find the show notes for each episode, written articles on the themes of the podcast, and a library of resources on the topic of emerging tech and automation. Also, if you want to reach out and leave any feedback or you have any questions about the podcast or any of the conversations, there are general contact links such as email, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. for you there on the website. And finally, for those of you that want more than just an audio conversation, the video recordings are now going to be up on YouTube for the newer conversations. So feel free to check out the videos by searching for Automated Podcast on YouTube, where, of course, you can like and subscribe if you prefer to support the podcast that way. The 
the automated podcast.